On tonight's roundtable, we'll ask our Knights of the Zoom roundtable these questions. Does anyone have a good story involving a junkyard part repair that saved you money? If it cost, uh, if cost was not a concern, what was the one modification you would love to do to your Jeep? Do you have any Jeeping hacks you use for wheeling? Uh, and if we have time, uh, well, quite often we don't have time for the fourth question, but uh, do you go out alone? And if so, how hard do you push it? Are you ready? It's the Jeep Dog Show with Wendy. There will be body damage. Jock. I like making people laugh. That's It's good for my soul. Jock. Yeah, I don't think so. And I think mean, that's a huge deal. So sit back, strap in, and brace yourself. Hello, I'm Tony, and I'm your host for this Roundtable episode. The Roundtable is recorded every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central Time, and you can be a part of it. Join our Zoom meeting. To join our Zoom meeting, rather, get notifications and the link to join by signing up for our newsletter. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to sign up. All right, we now go to the Knights of the Zoom Roundtable. Please remember to say your first name and location the first time you speak on this episode. Uh, I'm hoping everybody survived Christmas and New Year's. I mean, I see you here, so you must have survived in some capacity. Just a bit. (laughs) Then we went home. Oh, yeah. Survived the freeze. Always a good thing. Survived Christmas, still eating leftovers. All right, I got a question real quick that uh, uh, Andrew was talking about. Andrew, you won a, a Jeep. Uh, that's that's a big thing to say. Uh, and uh, it's it's being repaired because the transmission, the, the standard transmission has gone out in it. it. Can you, I mean, it is, tell us the year, the make, all that stuff. I mean, we know it's a Jeep, but uh, it's a JL or JLU. And how many miles uh, did you get on it before you started having a, a transmission noises? Uh, it was, a, it's a 2022 JLU. Uh, I think it's a Sport S Unlimited. Um, when I started making miles, it was at 5,200 miles, and it finally went to the dealer at 5,400 miles uh, because of the racket it was making in the transmission. Originally, I thought it was a clutch issue, but it ended up being the transmission, but they're replacing the clutch, throw out bearing transmission, and then six different sensors between the trans transfer case and the rear end due to some some short or something with the with the sensors. So, are you glad that it's a transmission issue and not a clutch issue, or do you? Does it matter one way or another? Six away, six one way, twelve or another. You know. Yeah, I guess the transmission is a little scarier, especially being a standard transmission. Those things are are generally bulletproof. Usually, didn't they switch transmissions with the JL? Because I mean, for years with the JK and the TJ, and everything, they were running the NSG three seventy. I think it is. Yeah, it's the NSG three seventy. What's the model of the JL? Because it's not the same, right? I know the shift pattern is different. Uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. But I do know there's an NSG um, 70 wide ratio and a narrow ratio between the, the TJs and the JKs. I know that much. Larry, I think it you were trying Larry to speak. From St. Louis. It is Larry from St. Louis. I know it's one thing John and I talk about periodically because he's got a JK. His is also, I believe yours is an 18 also, John, isn't it? No, it's a 17. 17. Now I've got an 18 JL and the shift patterns are different. The, re- you know, the reverse position is different in those, in those two, two transmissions. But well, yours, uh, the JL uses automatic transmission fluid instead of single. Yes. Yeah, er- er- everything is the ATF. The axles, the transmission, everything takes it. Wait a minute, not the axles. <laughs> transfer case. Transfer, transfer, transfer case and transmission. <laughs> but the jail's got those special access. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, let's um, let's go with our first question. Hopefully that uh, transmission issue will get uh, rounded out and you will be able to get more than 10,000 miles on it before the uh, next transmission has to be put in. So uh, does anyone have a good story involving a junkyard part repair that, that saved, saved you money. money. And this, this one, one is from, from our Zoom, Zoom member, John. Tony, I don't know what, uh, it sounded like you were uh, the stadium announcer guy that asked if we get, are ready to rumble there for a second. <laughs> are we ready to rumble? Although, do you get do you get a takedown notice for that? I can't remember. Yeah, you just, you, you, you're going to get the lawsuit now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad echo. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say truth for myself that most of the parts that 
that will break, you know, alternators and master cylinders and all that kind of stuff. I won't go to a junkyard for that kind of thing because it, there just isn't enough. There just isn't enough there to save versus, you know, doing it again when that one goes out or if it was already broke. If you're talking body panels or something like that, then that's a whole other story. You're right. Your broken part was a, a junkyard part just before it broke. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know some people go and get transmissions and uh, motors, and they just uh, swap them out. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess it's just. I, I guess it's the mindset. I, I never like doing that amount of work uh, for something that I don't know what the, the really anything about it. Uh, I'm, I'm putting it in there, and how long is it going to be before I'm replacing it? I think it's, it was more prevalent probably in the older model Jeeps. I think. I think the newer ones are probably more or less going back to the parts store. Well, the, the junkyard motor, if you go through a little bit, that wouldn't be all too bad. But you just got to expect, you, you got to take off all the uh, wear components off of it and just get those replaced before you install it. I guess you also hear a lot about the junkyard axles, what the one-ton axle swaps. I guess that would save you some money if you had a right. welder and a fabrication skill set um, to be able to put your own one-ton axles right under your Jeep. Yeah, because typically you're buying those for the housing, right? Right. You're going to go through, and you're probably going to change the gears and put the lockers in. But before they're before those are all done, they're almost like brand new. Well, this is Roger from Wisconsin, but I mean, you could say the same thing about an engine. I mean, if you're going to buy the engine just to just to swap out and put it in without having anything tested, I mean, that's basically what you had before it broke. But if you're going to go in and you're going to re, you're going there and you're getting it and you're rebuilding it, I mean, then I guess it wouldn't be so bad. If you're, as long as you're going to go through it and inspect it all. This will depend on the kind of damage that was done in the first place. If you're replacing the engine with like catastrophic failure, you just needed a block or something. Not everything else. It's kind of hard to, to justify a multi thousand dollar engine or transmission in a five hundred dollar uh, uh, Jeep. So uh, I guess that's part of the uh, going to the junkyard and uh, getting uh, uh, critical components like that. I think it's, that's probably where it goes back to is this like a daily driver or weekend warrior kind of rig or just talking about a trail rig right because i think maybe you're building up just like a i don't know let's say a a, a yj that was multiple colors and swapping it v8s and stuff like that i mean there's probably quite a few parts that you would be okay with going to use because you're going to trailer it out to the park every time right or whatever. yeah and if you're doing a one-ton swap i mean that's that's where most of those axles come from you know because you need you need the good housing and those aren't something that's just readily available. So that's that's usually your, unless you got a buddy who had an axle laying around, that's typically where you're getting that, that type of stuff from. Well, I see people do that with uh, with their, their spare parts they carry on the trail with them in case of breakdowns. As if it's something that you're you're not looking to be like a long-term upgrade or install, you're just looking for a cheap axle shaft or something like that just to help get you off the trail or something that can be used in that capacity. Kind of makes sense. Yeah, but something like an axle shaft, I mean, would you really want to take what you had in it out because it broke, put a put a junk one in just to get you off the trail, and then do the repair all over again when you got home with a new one? Huh? Get, get you off the trail. You have to get you off the trail. But, but, a, but a new one would get you off the trail just as easy as a, a, a one out of the junkyard would. It might, but it may not. So if you're, gonna spend, if you're going to spend the money on a used one, why not just have a new one sitting there? Well, what if you did an upgrade, like maybe you switched out to chromoly axles and you had the soccer laying around that you just... Uh, and then have the, have the chromoly one as your stock one until the stock one breaks, or as your backup until the stock one breaks. Uh, uh, where's the fun of that? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stick to the chromoly. <laughs> I suppose nothing worth doing isn't worth doing twice, right? <laughs> First time with this practice. You may not have all the tools to do it exactly how you wanted to do it on the trail either. So, in other words, you know, you may not have a torque wrench with you. You may not have things that you would want to be able to do it absolutely right. You're probably going to be pulling it apart and, and trying it again anyway. Just send it home with a couple of Duggas. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you've got an impact, maybe. <laughs> so, I, but like I said, I think a lot of the older Jeeps, sometimes you kind of have to go to the junkyards. Uh, it looks like Jimmy just 
just joined. I know he's rebuilding a full size Jeep. I think it's a wagon here or something. That's yep. one of the parts he can only get from a junkyard because they're no longer in production. Yep. And they're the dumbest parts ever. <laughs> and they want a fortune for him from the junkyard. The the it, later edition Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneers have this thing called a brump bumperette on the front bumper that plastic formed plastic pieces. They go on eBay because you can't get them from the junkyard or else they're so trashed, used in used looking condition for over $300 a set. I'm going to, it's one of our, my 3D projects for my brother when he gets his stuff set up down here because he's got a 3D scanner. <clears throat> and then we'll be able to print it in TPU and because no one makes new ones. No one's thought to make a form. I'm like, we can take this file and make it a mold. And because my brother was a tool and die maker before he retired. Like, he can make damn near anything, and if he knows he knows the processes to do it, it'll be great. That's kind of one of the same lines as the junkyard part is making something yourself with whatever you got to, to fulfill the role to save money. Whether it's right, I probably the business he was a tool and time maker at was was a family business. It was a business my grandfather built, and um, they were you know struggling to do tool and die because it's just a dying industry in the United States, and. Um, <clears throat> I went to them once and I'm like, hey, we need to get into this vintage car scene and become fabricators and make parts for specific vehicles. And you got to find the parts for the vehicles that no one else makes. And then you make a stamp because they, they did a lot of stamping. So you set up the die once and you run 50 and you only have to keep 50 around. And if you do that with a part here and a part there while you're still making your bread and butter on the tool and die, you need to carry a little extra insurance for the fabrication side of it. As long as it's not a structural form that puts people in danger, like the Grand Wagoneer, another piece that you can't get anywhere is for the electric window regulator for the for the tailgate. And then there's a piece I, I can't even figure out how to find. There's there's this um they have that chrome looking molding that goes up the A pillar. And that chrome looking molding that goes up the A pillar um is plastic with a foil on the inside so you can't reuse it you can't get it off there 30 years old without destroying the plastic and i have literally not found any place you can buy that piece was there a like a website or something you can go to to be able to search these junkyards for availability of parts and stuff um or something besides just walking out to the junkyard yourself and strolling up and down the uh the aisles hoping to get lucky kind of thing is there some sort of a uh, database or whatever that they use uh, there's a couple of mass junkyards that I've found so far. It seems like it's better to just call them and then pay them to pick it and send it to you because most of the ones I found for the Grand Wagon user in Arizona and, and uh, New Mexico, and I'm not driving there just to pick a $50 part. Car-part.com. Car Car-part.com. <clears throat> it's a database of thousands of junkyards all over the country. There you go. Ah, oh, what's up, Bob? Bob, they're Bob. calling you to thank you for the plug. <laughs> Are we already on recording today? Oh yeah, eight p.m. Central Time. Oh crap! I just you are on, on the show. show. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jimmy from Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> We are recording and we are on YouTube Live, and now we have uh, audio on YouTube Live as well. That was uh, part of the echoing problem we had at the uh, the beginning of the show. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the things. And I, my buddy's got this scout too on my property. He's doing the same thing, uh, just to find the parts. He's going all over the place. He drove from here to um, he drove like five hours away just to pull a new carburetor to fit the original V eight engine in the thing. Did you, uh, I, this is probably a dumb question, but did you consider getting a donor Jeep, pulling parts off of it? Yeah, but they want $2,500 for a donor Jeep now, and that's what I paid for mine when I got it. Well, you don't think you could sell it for a good a good amount uh, once you got the stuff off of it you needed? I mean, they're pretty rare, aren't they? They're, well, they're pretty rare for a reason, because either they're without axles sitting on their bellies in a junkyard because all the yj owners in the 90s pulled the axles because oh, they're yeah. dana 44 open knuckle axles and then they if from the, the the 90s or they're so rusted out that only a couple interior parts are worth pulling gotcha because it's it's 80s amc 
Just like we've all heard Chuck talk about how, how crappy were they built in the 80s. <clears throat> they were built in Kenosha. Um, the Grand Wagoneer was in the 80s. And uh, it was actually common commonplace that they would deliver the Grand Wagoneer to to the to showroom floor and it goes straight into straight into the body shop to have the panels aligned properly hmm. uh how close are you to be de- being done percentage wise oh depends on how far it's a rest, resto mod so i'm not doing like a showroom but um the engine's been replaced um i have uh you know so now it's got an egr delete and i've got uh um, malroy hei on there so i've gotten rid of the crappy ignition parts <laughs> um and the stupid smog stuff and it's got fresh paint i have to put wood paneling back on it i'm not going vinyl i'm gonna go with real wood and then i gotta do interior still but interior is really more of like when i have the money to plunk down on interior because it needs new seat covers i haven't decided whether i'm gonna do new carpet yet and then i'll probably do a stereo and some door panels some uh, door cards and you has got a good headliner and stuff, so most of it's good. And you're planning on visiting it in the garage every every other weekend, or are you planning on driving it back and forth to work? Or yes, this is for shows. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I bought it as a daily driver. Actually, when I bought my Wagoneer, it was a daily driver when I had given up my LJ, um, and we were just destitute. And I was like, "Well, I want something cool. If I'm gonna do it, I got on a Greyhound, the bag full of tools." bought it off ebay and went down there and picked it up and drove it drove it back sight unseen in the middle of tornado season with the radio f- on the fritz the whole way back that's like 11 well, years ago sometimes it's better not to know right just uh <laughs> let the tornado be the surprise <laughs> yeah it wasn't a short drive either i, I got on a greyhound it was a 16 hour greyhound from chicago to oklahoma city and i didn't even get outside oklahoma city before they, i found out that they overfilled it with oil and oil started shooting out the 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 intake hose, the filler hose. Right. <clears throat> so smoke starts pouring out because it's now all over the engine because it shot out the top of it. And I'm like 50 miles into my drive. And I had a buddy that was willing to come pick me up, but I don't want to make him take off work if he didn't have to. And if I was going to break down the way back, I was going to break down the way back. But yeah, that was the last, that was the last problem I had. I drove it overnight. So I was up for like 30 hours, 16 hours down and 12 and a, 12 back up. So, 28 hours straight <laughs> well you certainly have a history with it for sure at least uh, uh, one that you started with and, and it made it back right it was just uh yeah. too much oil so yeah and then i drove it um on that engine for probably about thirty thousand miles twenty thousand miles twenty thousand miles and uh, got a lower end knock and that's when i got to do the the new new engine and it happened to be i was on the forum i was on uh, I'd been watching this guy get ready to do his LS build, and he said, "I'm I'm going to sell my old my AMC on at 360 with with the same engine. It was one year newer; it was an 88 instead of an 87. The only difference between 88 and 87 is the starter and flywheel uh, uh, flex plate. <clears throat> so I bought it from him, and the thing runs like a top. Very cool. All right, anybody else? Uh, does anybody have a, a good story involving a junkyard part repair that saved you money? We grew up going to the junkyards. We spent as much time crawling on things in the junkyard as we did anything else when I was younger. We were on first name basis with all the guys out there when we did that. Uh, I have another one. I bought an X Chef at eBay too. And it had no dashboard, so I got it for like under fifteen hundred dollars. Very nice. And we, my buddy and I started troubleshooting the electrical system and found out it had a bad junction box. So instead of a thousand dollars in electrical work it was thirty dollars pulling a uh, junction box out of the inner inner fender wall and uh, i'm i'm just assuming you got a dash from someplace local and stuck it in there or it was just the junction box the guy had hit a deer and then he had like he was sloppy about how he put it back together almost like you know i love xjs but xj owners are not nice to their xjs right and this guy kind of fit went went suit right with that and uh, it leaked water straight down because he had, after he hit that deer, he took the fender off and didn't put it back on right. And it was leaking water down directly on the junction box. Now, I got another 100,000 miles out of it. I bought with 160,000 miles on it. I got another 100,000 miles on it. I sold it to a buddy for $1,000 and he got another 70,000 miles out of it. <laughs> and he was doing hardwood, hard, hardwood, hardwood installation on, out of it. My goodness, a working uh, XJ. 
<laughs> over a $30 fix in a new set of tires. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't know until you find out, right? I mean, sometimes it's uh, it's not so good. Sometimes it is, but uh, worth a look. All right. Well, let's move it's on to our second. Talk. I don't want to turn to John. Let's uh, move over to our, our next question here for the roundtable. And if uh, you're new to the roundtable, new to listening, we have a series of questions that we ask or we have a guest that we do a, a little uh, mini interview and then uh, turn it over to the Zoom people for a QA. and uh, And we're going to be having some more of those here in the future. Oh, by the way, I, I forget who it was that suggested it. I think it was uh, uh, Chris and I uh, can't remember if it was Bob. Uh, but uh, somebody was suggesting uh, to get uh, Tom Rapp uh, the uh, creator and singer of Christmas Cheer. And I have uh, been in contact with Tom, and we're getting that scheduled up for a nice roundtable discussion. And we're promising you to play the Christmas Cheer song at least four times. So you won't want to miss that. All right, so our next question is, if cost was not a concern, what is the one modification you would love to do to your Jeep? Also a question from John. John from Central Texas, and I'll provide a quick answer. Hemi swap. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably going to be a, a big answer for a lot, but I, mean, that was, I always thought that would be a pretty awesome, you know, throw out the JK and you see it on YouTube, but Bill is not going to be tonight. He's got a factory 392. And once you've kind of opened it on and set it up, Josh is playing the uh, the role of Bob tonight with making lots of background noises. <laughs> yeah, so the oh, and heavy, uh, let me just since since I interrupted this, John, let me let you know your your audio is a little little lower than normal. Uh, it's it's actually quite low in the recording, so uh, I don't know if you've got it turned down or you're just uh, in a good mood after being off for a while. But I'm pretty sure it was turned down. There so. you go. That sounds good. Yeah. So uh, if, if you couldn't hear me, it was the Hemi. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's my no questions asked, and, and I would want it kind of done right. So um, because the, the the drive line that I want is that they do a lot of automatic Hemi swaps, but you really don't see any manual Hemi swaps out there. Very, I mean, it's very rare that you see one. And um, that's something that I would love is to have a manual Hemi in the in the JK. So, is that a I mean, transmission uh, issue that uh, the the transmission won't handle it, or uh, why do you think that is? One, yeah, the factory one won't, right? So if you're trying to run it through an NSG 370 or something with that much, it's not not a good idea. But um, so that means you have to get uh, like a Tremec T6 or something like that and find an off road version of that that'll hook up to the Hemi because most of them are set up for you know high performance muscle cars or sports cars or something like that. They're not set up for off roads. The gears are all wrong. With the yeah, that's what I was thinking is I didn't, I, I thought that they only did the Hemi on cars with stick because they, they don't do manual on any of the vehicles with Hemis with a, with a manual. On them. They don't, but you have a couple of aftermarket suppliers like Silver Sport Transmissions and others that have an off-road version of the uh, Tremec T6 that originally was designed to go behind the 360 for the older Jeeps. And but then you're gonna have to recam it too. You can't just you can't just use the Hemi straight off of that that pairs up with it because if you didn't recam it or you'd have to modify it because um, the the tune for that engine is meant for the truck tune, and that and th- then you'd be on the car tune or you'd have to get in a whole new. I think you would just mod- probably get a whole new set. I mean, you probably do something like an AMW set, but that's where the cost comes in. Because now you're talking thirty, forty thousand dollars, right, to get all that. And if you're going that far, you got to throw the atlas behind it too, right? You can't oh, just yeah. you, can't, you can't just leave it be. With you got to have the axles too, otherwise you're gonna blow them out. <laughs> exactly. That's where the cost starts really adding up, right? So yep. your simple Hemi swap is, you know, probably closing in to fifty grand if you're doing a JK. Now, but you would do, would you do five point seven? Would you six point four? Would you do six point two with the cost with the Hellcat no, Hellcat cost. superchargers? Cost is no measure. That's a elephant all the way. <laughs> exactly. The only, if we're talking cost is no 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 issue there, it's, it's definitely a elephant. And because, if you tune up the elephant, even better. Exactly. Why why not why not go off roading with eight hundred horsepower? Right. I mean, it's mandatory. No. Yeah. Well, you know, you could just go with like a six BT and see how that goes, or a Cummins twelve valve. 
<laughs> it would be like out some forty twos. So <laughs> throw a twelve up in there, and every bolt will rattle out of the cheapest truck. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not riding behind you. There's no telling <laughs> flying out the back of that thing. Is it hailing or is that uh, parts from a Hemi? So I yeah. don't know if you guys know about uh, America's Most Wanted Four by Four. It's a uh, a Jeep shop up in uh, up there in uh, uh, Greg Henderson's uh, neck of the woods. Uh, and uh, they put uh, Hemi's in Jeeps, and uh, they sell, they'll sell Jeeps with Hemi's already in them. Uh, but they do uh, Jeep Hemi conversions, and we uh, recently did an interview uh, with them. And I think I mentioned you a couple of times, John, because I figured, you know, ever since uh, Bill got the 392, you were going to be really anxious for a Hemi. If so, they want a sponsor, I'll, I will make all kinds of Instagram posts. <laughs> <Show it laughs> <off> and <laughs> well, at, at thirty and forty thousand dollars, I don't think you have, you have the the reach necessary to, to cover that. But I, I get what you mean. Well, but you can I'm go to like, uh, amw four by or four x four dot com. Amw America's Most Wanted, and have a look at some of that stuff. It is just gorgeous. And uh, talking to to Greg, uh, I, I I told Greg I, who I had interviewed, uh, and I'm talking about unofficial use only, Greg Henderson, uh, and he says, oh yeah, they're just down the road a bit, uh, and uh, that uh, that uh, I think he said Jared uh, has been doing really really good with those uh, those Hemi conversions over there, good business. So, uh, but he spoke very highly of them. So I, I check it out, and uh, I don't have a date for that interview, but it was a, it was a fun interview. I mean, anytime you're talking about horsepower, it's fun, right? Well, they franchise their install, so they've actually got a lot That's of true. Yeah. All, all over the country. In fact, here in the Central Texas region, uh, just down south of Austin, the Grapples area, there's an Exodus 4x4 shop that has uh, their certified, they're part of the AMW um, franchise or whatever you want to call it, certified installers. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're great, but if I was going to spend forty grand, I mean, what? Uh, how, how Spending a little bit more just to let it go up there to where the, the original place is might be worth it to me. It might be. But I don't want if it would cost Larry three hundred bucks to ship a tire carrier to Arizona. I don't know how much it would cost to ship a cheap to Michigan. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but if you if you pull, pull, pull the B fix out before he shipped it, so. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the way a little bit. <laughs> if I'm dropping thirty to fifty grand on the elephant, the rest of that's kind of becomes jump change. Yeah, because before you're done, you're a hundred you're hundred grand in by the time you put the drivetrain and the axles and everything in. So. If you want it done right, ship like, it out. A lot of people try to cheap out on it and you know run factory axles, but then like factory drive lines. I mean the eight speed, like the HPE can handle it, but the rest of the drive line. I mean even the the factory three ninety two, it runs all wheel drive for that reason, right? So you're not twisting up the rear end and everything else. And well, I mean you're in control of that with your foot, right? No, you're not. Not <laughs> 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 once you heard that sound of it revving up. Whatever you, all you want to do is put your foot to the oh, floor. Oh, of course. I know exactly what, you, what you're what you talking about. The little the little kid inside comes right out. <laughs> I, I was thinking about the part that's halfway between the brain and the foot that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> the tingling. <laughs> yeah. I like the vibration is what you're saying. <laughs> Punch it. All right. Who yeah. else? Who else? So the, I know you guys have a wish list and uh, you have something at the top of your list. So... Uh, what's uh, what's the thing that if uh, cost was not a concern, what modification would you love to do to your Jeep? If uh, cost wasn't an option, it wasn't a concern, I'd do a super stretch on a TJ. Like a limo? <laughs> no, I think we seen one of those posted the other day. <laughs> oh, no, not with the, 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 not with the two doors. axles in the rear, Bob. I mean, come on. He wants to be a tour guide <laughs> in Colorado. He's going to shuttle people around. No, no, just one. They do a 24-inch stretch of the body and frame. Uh, you can add extra seats if you want. Yeah, you guys, do an LJ. Yeah, yeah basically. It's longer than an LJ. So I got the uh, perfect picture of one of those for you. <laughs> yeah, the LJ was only 12 inches longer on the wheelbase and 10 inches past longer in the, after, after the wheel, I think, right? 15 inches total, only 10 inches in the wheelbase. There you go. Get yourself one of them. They're tour jeeps they got. They never sell them till they're junk. Your uh, your horn. You could modify the horn, and it could say the plane, the plane. 
Nobody gets the reference. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're just trying. airplane. <laughs> All right, Steve-O, come on, let's hear it. You gotta paint your your Jeep red. <laughs> if, I, if I had a model, it wouldn't be necessary for the Jeep. Would be buying a Grand Wagoneer and a trailer to tow it. Tow the Grand Wagoneer? No, a Grand Wagoneer to tow. <laughs> you know, the, uh, I mean, those things are fancy inside, aren't they? Fuck yeah! <laughs> if I had the money for that, I can go for that. Hurt me. Well, that, that's interesting. Would you, uh, for for the same amount of money, and I, I guess cost isn't an option in this, but if you were going to spend forty, fifty grand for uh, uh, just putting a, a Hemi in a, a vehicle, would it be better just to get a hundred thousand dollar vehicle? I mean, I know that the Grand Wagoneer isn't the same thing as an off road vehicle, but it sure is fancy. You could live in there. Uh, not, not for me because mine's in my case the Jeep's paid off, and I've already got all the other mods I really like kind of set up on it so i don't i wouldn't want to start over from scratch on that mm. yeah that's kind of the downside to uh, doing all the work to the thing you you really don't want to start over i mean i guess some people might i, I just hate the idea of putting a bunch of mods in and then uh getting something else and having to do it all over again i guess if uh somebody else is doing it for you and you're tapping your watch going hey it's, it's time for you to be done i need that jeep back it might be a little different and, and, and if you had the funds uh, speaking of having the funds, uh, tell me about what was it you bought a shifter or something for your for your Jeep, John? What, what I saw yeah. that on Discord, but I don't know exactly. Uh, I, mean, I, know, so, I know what a shifter is used for, but why were you getting a, a new one? So we were actually talking about this on the the New Year's Eve Zoom room we had. Okay, uh, where we had a, several of us join in there. And um, if you've had the JK six speed manual or those, you know that it's it's real loose, and then the shift throws are really long. And I've actually had it pop out of like reverse and a few others for me and stuff like that. So uh, B&M makes a, a shifter that goes into it, sits right on top, and it's uh, just a direct swap in. Uh, you also can buy the new shift handle, so you got the cool B&M shift handle or whatever on there. Um, but I've read a lot of reviews. I've been looking at it for the last couple of years, and then when we were on the on the Zoom call New Year's Eve, it just kind of popped back up my my mind. I know... Um, Roger on the Zoom call here, he's actually got the same shifter he installed on his uh, 17 JK uh, Rubicon. And it, he said it made a huge difference as well. So I got that personal feedback. And no, it, I, tighten, it, tightens, it tightens up the gears quite a bit. So they're not, it, it's not as sloppy. I mean, when it's in gear, when you get it in gear, it's a positive positive feeling that's in gear. And, and it also, I think it reduces the throw by like 30%. Yeah, yeah. it reduces the throw by 30%. I have one in my LJ. It also works for the JK, and that thing is badass. So basically yeah. what you do is you take the, the top of the shifter off of the transmission and put this one on it. Yeah, it's four bolts. It's super easy yeah. to do. Yeah. Well, I had to, yeah, I had, all this, I had all to shift housing. I had to remove that whenever I was doing the, the clutch and the TJ. So I, just looking at it, that's what it kind of reminded me of. But whenever you're doing the description, John, it's not like you just – you sound like you put it on top, which it sounded to me like you don't take the old one off. Yeah, it, it, well, it is on top. I mean, you go in through the – you just go in through the top. You, the only thing you really got to do is drop the, the cross member and drop the transmission a little bit to get the gasket out. But once you get the gasket out, it's it really is. Once you get to it, the uh, the, the swapping out is quick and easy. Oh, yeah. It's the getting to it and then putting it all back together is what actually takes a little time. No, of course. That, and quick and easy shouldn't be – those words shouldn't be used in conjunction with everything else you got to do no. to, to get to it. <laughs> hey, John, how much did that thing cost you? So I actually found it um, on Amazon, believe it or not, for $100 cheaper than it was on Quadratech. And Northridge is where I went first to try to use our discount, but they don't even sell it. So, um, But I found it for just over 500 bucks. Oh, uh, my goodness. Uh, it's worth it, though. Yeah, especially I, if, but especially so I, if you got that, uh, that six... When, one, when I got mine, I mean, I did some reading up on it because I was having the same problem that John was having where it would pop out of gear. And it seems like that was uh, pretty notorious for it. And that, that B&M shifter was, it, it, it's nicer and it also fixed, fixed something for you. Mm -hmm. It fixed the whole pulling out of gear. Yeah. And it was, I actually sprung for a little bit more and got the, uh, the B&M shift lever as well. So, but you can actually run it with the factory shift lever. You don't have to upgrade to the B&M one. Yeah. Well, I would hope that would kind of make the shifting a little smoother or have some uh, uh, positive uh, use for the uh, the additional expense. 
Eh, I, all it really, all the shifter does is just really um, change uh, your hand positioning. Is all it does. It just like I think the only difference between the two is the the B and M one is bent a little bit slightly towards the rear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, which, but then which, then you got to go through the cost of swapping out the transfer case handle so that it looks the same. And I think the the transfer case handle the the swap out is is actually quite a bit taller. It brings it up dang near to oh I don't know right around where your if you got power mirrors right around where your power mirror hand, power mirror button is on the center console. You're, you're forgetting one very important thing that the shift lever does, and that is that it, it looks, it, it looks cool. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, you ain't gonna sell me on that one. <laughs> it's underneath your hand the whole time. You can't see it until you take your hand off. So well, when I you mean, when you said it had the the BMM uh, BNM uh, handle on it, is it a T handle? I mean, I remember having a Hearst no. T handle, and I thought to myself that I mean it was kind of cool for a car, but I think it would be, be kind of sucky for a Jeep. No, it's, it's a round- basically the exact same handle. Only it's just bent in a different spot, and it just got like if you were to take the eight ball and put B and M B and M on it and screw it onto the end of the handle, that's what you get. All right, I misunderstood. When I when I think handle, I think about the the thing that you put your hand on, not the the bar, the the shifting bar itself. You're talking about the bar. It's the whole thing. It's the the so the shifter B and M is installed on top of the transmission, mm-hmm. and the lever is is the bar that comes up, and then the handle. That's all together as well. Yeah. So right. You can use the factory bar and handle on the shifter that goes on top of the transmission, or you can replace it to the B&M bar handle at the top. Mm-hmm. And Does well, it come I with would, that $500 piece, or is that something you have to buy extra? Well, you have to buy extra. extra. Oh, well, that's, I think how, that's how they get three, you. No, 300 bucks for it. <laughs> no, it was, it was less than 200 <laughs> Well, that's cool that, uh, I mean, it's a shame that uh, that uh, Northridge didn't have it, uh, and because uh, that discount's always a real good one. Jeep Talk Show is the discount over at Northridge, if you guys don't know about it. It's been some time since we uh, we did the interview with David, and he graciously uh, provided that uh, that very good discount. Uh, John has uh, uh, has saved uh, over $37,000, I think, on, uh, <laughs> on purchases there. What a bit. But uh, very, very nice uh, discount over there. And it, it varies depending on uh, wh- wh- what you're buying because the, their their prices vary. Uh, their discounts vary with depending on who they're selling. Uh, I, I actually bought both uh, front and rear uh, motorbuilt bumpers uh, through Northridge and got free shipping. And uh, gosh, I think I got that, that front bumper. No, it was the rear bumper uh, that was really big and heavy. I think I got that within three days of ordering it. So it was almost like buying something from Amazon. So I uh, I posted in the Discord, Tony, that we have. I posted a uh, picture of what the the whole ship thing installed looks like. Oh, okay, great. Well, when are you going to be doing that, by the way? Well, I've got some more parts I'm waiting to come in and going to book an appointment over at Bill's Garage and see when we can get them all installed. So we're also going to drop the rear axle to put some new rear control arm skids on and some uh, some rear coil spring alignment. Um, Bucks or whatever you want to call them in there for metal cloak, got put in. So we got a few other things. I'm waiting on all the parts to come in. Yeah, makes sense. You should go to the, twi- I think it's called Twisted Twisted Shifter Z or Twisted Shifter. Yeah, I think it's Twisted Sister. Twisted Shifter Z. They make a bunch of different no- or design a bunch of different knobs for the top and they- that would all work with that B&M shifter. Then you can really customize it. <laughs> And John, I know you were just looking at the JK, but do they make those uh, shifters for the the JLs, the JTs, the whole family? Uh, they 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 do. Larry was just saying because he was looking at the one for the JL. Right, it's a lot cheaper too. You almost buy the transfer case and the transmission for what they sell the just the transmission for for the JK, and it's a longer lever for the transfer case too, so you get a little bit more leverage on it. Just like, just like it is on a JK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Modifications are a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, I like after they're done and, and making a, a, a difference in how the, the vehicle functions. It's, uh, so I'm not, I know some people like actually making the modifications. Hell, some people like building the modifications themselves, but, uh, I'm yeah. more of a, I'll, I'll put it in, but it's kind of like, uh, it pisses me off because <laughs> nothing ever goes yeah, exactly the way you want it to go. <laughs> 
And if you don't think other things are listening, and my Instagram feed just popped up, America's Most Wanted, and then they hit the Hemi swap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> just saying. All right, let's uh, let's jump over to our next question. Unless somebody has a another uh, a modification that you'd love to have that uh, you wouldn't think of uh, without, uh, since you don't want to spend that kind of money. Oh, the axles would be nice. Oh yeah, that are real nice axles. This is Tony from Michigan. I still want a four BT swap my XJ. Would you would you fix it so that you could run French fry oil? Uh, in there as a as a fuel because I I still think that driving down making everybody hungry for French fries would be just worth it uh, by itself. In a way, I would want it to run multi fuel, basically anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you spit in the gas tank, it'll run it <laughs> somehow. Somehow. Yeah, but it if it smelled like McDonald's fries, you'd have to sell it with a porta potty. I like McDonald's fries. I haven't yeah. had any in years, it's but extra- those were always that was one of the best things at McDonald's. Of course, mm. that's smell. The French fry. Do you guys have uh, have Red Robin uh, restaurants around the country? I don't know if that's a local thing or not. Yes, we do. I love those French fries. I'm not a big uh, steak French fry guy type person, but uh, getting those things ordered them extra crispy is uh, just so damn good. Yeah, and that Red Robin salt. Yep. yep. Easy. People look at me funny uh, if I get the um, the fish and chips. I'll actually get extra tartar sauce that I can dip my French fries in. That's I do. I do that. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's normal. It's good stuff. I got to try harder. I don't like being normal. All right, let's go to let's move on to our next question. Uh, do you have? And I like this one. This was pretty cool. I never even thought about this. Do you have any uh, any uh, jeeping hacks you use for wheeling? Uh, for example, the top of the logo on the center caps of the of wheels uh, always point towards the valve stem and wheel lock uh, making it easy to uh, identify where the uh, airing up and down or dismounting the wheels and this is from bill a uh, 392 bill uh, we just need to change your name to 392 bill bill yeah it makes it uh, real easy when especially when you can't you know the valve stems kind of on up, up top there where you can't see it when you're looking down so i just look at my little logo on my uh, wheel there and it's pointing right to it so makes it nice and then my wheel lugs you know you got the one that's a lock there but it kind of blends in with all the other lug nuts so it's kind of nice you know okay the key needs to go on this one so. oh i didn't understand that when you said uh in in the question here where you said lock the the example you gave i was thinking you meant like the locks so you could lock in the axles and that kind of threw me for a loop because i didn't think anybody uh locks on a modern day uh jeep uh locks the axles in locks the hubs not the locking the the, the locking lug nut yeah right. so, that makes sense yeah yeah so, so do you chew the, chew their ass out at a discount if they don't put it back right? Well, they never do. So I always my OCD <laughs> kicks me and I go and I have to go find it and then reposition the the caps and the you know find the the, the wheel lug and lock and, and move it. But yeah, I get it all set up. So I kind of got my little my little system there. But it makes it really easy. Like I said, when you're just airing down, I just you got to you know my my logo has kind of like an arrow on it so it's almost like just pointing right where the the valve stems at so mm-hmm. uh, just a little hack there that works works well for me yeah it's handy uh because you, you always have to sit there and and look for the uh the valve uh, stem now of course you could put this uh some little led uh, lights on those valve stems you ever think about that uh, so that they light up when they spin there you go yeah <laughs> So I, I got to ask, this isn't the question, but Bill, uh, John is doing more stuff to his Jeep. Does that, does that mean that you have to do more to yours? It's a competition here, right? Well, I mean, I did the Hemi swap already, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's already beat me on that. <laughs> but you said earlier, why would anybody do that? Because you got to pull all your mods off. Well, that's exactly what I did. I oh, I know. <laughs> my mods off, I pulled the axles off. I mean, everything that was on there, I, I pulled off that old Jeep. So it was... Uh, it was a lot of work. It may have been easier just to put the Hemi in, but when I did the map, I was looking at America's Most Wanted and, and the, the, the cost and just all the other work I'd have to do. Once you kind of you do the numbers or whatever, it's just especially with the resale values of, of you know what I could get for my my Jeep. It just the math said buying a, a factory built 392 made more made more sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you spent a lot of weekends uh, uh, taking stuff off modifications you had made on your your prior JL. It was a JL, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was a JL Rubicon. Yeah. 
it was red like this one. So well, I mean, of course. So it's funny as I bought this thing, I swapped everything out. I took it to work and nobody really noticed on there <laughs> until I started it up. And then this guy, the next day I come into work, he's like, did you get a new exhaust? Yeah. Like, the exhaust. Right. Damn you. It's not a new exhaust. I mean, it is, but it, it, it's not the important part. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I got, yeah, I got a new exhaust and, and an engine. So a uh, couple of other parts as well. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. So, oh yeah, it, it really is. All right, so uh, anybody else have any jeeping hacks? I thought the uh, the I never had never thought or heard anything about the uh, you know the valve or locking uh, uh, the wheel locks, so keeping uh, making it easy to find them whenever you uh, go there. Anybody else got anything like that or something that you thought was cool? Always keep a hammer in the jeep just in case your starter goes out. That's okay. Yeah, I, I can yeah. see that. <laughs> yeah, what was that? the one? I'll, I'll mention the one for. Uh, for Chris, since he's not here tonight, but he, he always mentions your winch controller, putting it when you when you go off road and wheeling, putting it within reach and grasp, just so you don't have to try to climb in the back in case wherever you're stuck, you can't get your back hatch open or whatever. So having your recovery gear reachable from you know sitting in the driver's seat or something like something in the rear floorboard or something like that when you when you actually get on the trail mm-hmm. uh, was one Chris mentioned. I thought was pretty pretty neat. Maybe a molly panel on the back of uh, the the driver or passenger seat. Probably passenger would be easier to get to for the for the driver, and uh, a little uh, little bag for the controller right in there. Of course, you could always uh, uh, upgrade your winch with a uh, a wireless uh, remote. Uh, I think most of them support that. I think there's even just aftermarkets that you can use. I think it's a pretty simple um, uh, switching mechanism uh, in there that you can um, uh, pretty much do one uh, a generic solution to do that. So. Uh, it, it actually might be a good idea uh, as a uh, uh, something that you might guys might want to want to consider is having more than one controller, like the wireless and the the hardwired one. That's exactly what I was going to say. If you have a wireless controller, always carry either the harness that will attach it back to the winch, or a backup hardwired controller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Smitty Belt one is one of the ones that does charge that. it. Yeah. Or yep. Smitty Belt's got the wireless and it's got the, the yeah. wired harness that, that you can connect in. And, and it comes in synthetic. Just in case. Well, some of them. <laughs> so the best hack I can say is don't use the nets in the doors for anything. Oh, God. <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of <laughs> all I got. Steve doesn't lie. I got wow. sagging, sagging and that's it on both my jeeps on the passenger side because the wife didn't listen to me when i told her not to use them did you just see it sagging nuts <laughs> <Second nuts. laughs> well, you know, that's what i heard but <laughs> if God that's what you want to focus on steve you're welcome to focus hey, on. i wasn't the only one that heard it so <laughs> another hack is if uh you know if you don't want to deal with trying to figure out where to mount the, the high lift jack or whatever you just find a buddy that has one and go wheeling with him there so you, you don't go <laughs> oh hey i bring larry yeah. with me because he's got a welder yeah that's a i mean that's kind of a that's kind of a group ride hack though is you know weight on these jeeps is is pretty much insane now with all the armor and everything else you're putting on them so if you're going to go out in a group you know maybe split up some of those you know items like high lift shovel give up the weight things like that yeah, and you know when you want to be prepared, uh, the the weight does go up quite a bit. So uh, it's nice being prepared, but uh, I think it's kind of like the overlanding thing. I think a lot of people learn the hard way. They take a lot of stuff, and they're they're out there and they find that they really don't use as many of the things as they've taken along. I always, anytime I go anywhere and do anything, I always overpack. I, I overthink it, and uh, I think that takes away uh, from the from the fun. Sometimes having a problem can be fun. Coming up with a good solution can be fun. That's, every time, yeah, that's every time the best time you find what you every, need. Mm-hmm. Every time that I go out, uh, you know, wheeling and camping, because I do a lot of camping when we do it, when we go out, and anytime I go out doing that, um, I always, when I get home from the trip, go through the things that I took with me and look at the, all the items that I didn't use and try to take a couple of those and not take them along, take them off the list. Because if you don't use them over a couple of times, it's like, okay, maybe I really don't need that. Right. Well, that goes along with another one of uh, Bill's hacks. He's, he's got quite a few of these passed out. And one of them is 
whenever he's installing a mod on his Jeep, he always uses his his trail kit of tools. And, oh, yeah, that's a good one. That yeah. way, you know, you've got the, the the right tool for it. And if you if you're installing it, you realize, hey, I can't, I got don't have the right wrench or the right socket or something like that. Then that gets added to your bag. But that way, you're not taking more tools than you actually need, which are also very heavy. So I stole that one from Bill. That's very That's a good sound idea. advice. I've gotten really lucky that I've started jeeping and like this whole basically experience at a younger age to where I I found I started with smaller trips with as little stuff as possible where every time I go out I'd find oh I need this next time I come out so I'd bring that one or two items next time and make the trip a little, little longer. Oh, if I stay out this much longer, now I need this. Add that to the list. And Sounds like the end of the movie, The Jerk, where he's leaving and he's like, I need this. Yeah. This. <laughs> the paddleball game, the remote. Yeah, I kind of do that, but I do it. I do it backwards. I take the take all the stuff, the stuff that I don't know if I'll need or not. And then if I end up not needing it, I just leave it behind. I was too cheap to I'm, just buy it all up front like that. <laughs> well, I didn't say you'd ever need it, but there's some things you can take that you just might not need. I'm still no, I'm still looking for pizza in a cup. That was uh, the thing that uh, I've really been yeah, looking forward to. Yeah. Let's we'll uh, figure that out in the Overland I, I think I think that'd be more popular than ramen noodles. You know, pizza in a cup. Yes. I feel like that. Just thinking about that, that wouldn't be that hard to make. <laughs> Isn't it called the hot pocket? <laughs> well, look, but, pocket. There's, but there's no it's cup. Like a hot pocket, but in a cup. That's you right. have to have a cup. <laughs> but you can put the hot pocket in the cup. No, no, no. Well, that's how it you has heat to up come the hot pocket. in the cup. You put the cup in the microwave and heat it up, and you get pizza in a cup. But we're talking Overland, Red so it's a tin cup, pocket. and you put it on a fire. <laughs> that so, no, that no, would probably have to buy the the, the five hundred dollar stove, and then you have to buy the shelf for your back your back gate. So you can cook it on the back gate with the fancy stove just so you can heat up the tin cup that it's in. Yeah, I think I think they got this up in Dallas. So they have a, a pizza place called like the Thousand Degree Pizza or something like that where they, they put it in an oven that's a thousand degrees and uh, they cook the pizza. It has this special taste to it. I think it's it's charcoal is the special taste. That's kind of what you're talking about, Tony, with the, uh, the pizza in the cup on the fire. It would be like the thousand, uh, 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 thousand degree uh, pizza in a cup. Melted cups not included. Yeah, I'm from Chicago originally. I don't really pay attention to pizza in Texas. Damn, brother. How about uh, N- New York? How does it uh, compare to New York pizza? I think I've asked you this before. I just I have heard so much about New York pizza. Yeah, you mean New York trash, the the flimsy stuff they call pizza in New York. <laughs> they don't call pizza; they call pie. Number one, that's just wrong. Um, it's greasy. Pizza, you know, it's it's limp. I'm not hearing like, anything it, yeah, that I, I don't it like. Represents the city. It's all <laughs> limp and floppy. <laughs> It sounds great. <laughs> I know. Well, you had me. You had me a greasy. <laughs> it's basically your average Michigan gas station pizza. The only good pizza outside of Chicago is Detroit, is Detroit style, in my opinion. Oh yeah, and, and, and Chicago deep doesn't dish. just have deep dish. Yeah. Chicago doesn't just have deep dish. They yeah. also have thin crust, and that thin crust doesn't flop around like a piece of uncooked dough. I hate New York style, and it's everywhere because it's horrible compared <laughs> to a nice crisp. Thin crust pizza. Jimmy's yeah. been triggered. We, uh, yeah, well, I, I really like the thin crust, too. And I, I know everybody is going to say uh, booze and stuff to Papa John's, but getting uh, the thin crust uh, pizza from Papa John's and get it get it cut in squares, uh, it's like uh, having pizza on a cracker. It's uh, it's nice that's, and crisp and uh, very good. That's how you get it in Chicago. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have the big one that you can fold over. Oh God, I hate that shit. So, so let me ask, let me it's ask not you. Not a sandwich. So let me ask you guys about the about the Chicago Chicago style hot dog. Uh, James Coney Island down here had the Chicago style. Is that is that truly a Chicago style where they have the the relish, uh, really weird green, uh, funny green relish, the 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 green relish? Yeah, yeah, the pepper. Yeah, the only one question for you: Did the hot tomato? dog did did the hot dog snap when you bent it though? That, that's how you know when it's a good. Uh, you know, authentic Chicago dog. Yeah. And was it an all beef Vienna beef hot dog? That's right. Oh, I was gonna say it, it, it is so hard to find. Now? 
I, and I'll, I'll let you guys just make your own jokes on this, but it's so hard to find a good wiener for a hot dog. It, Not in Michigan. Is it? How good? dare you? <laughs> <laughs> that statement was so wrong. <laughs> we're well, assuming after you say that tony you believe that you have the good wiener right no no I, I have not been able to find anything for i love hot dogs but as far as the meat so you goes eating that in your jeep huh you so are you eating that in your jeep no no gordon he's certainly not the, the gladiator I'd, I'd get in trouble with the wife making uh, mustard you, stains on the in the the, the gladiator <laughs> You've got to get your hands on a Kogel Vienna hot dog. They travel the country annually, like state to state, but they're primarily in Michigan, I believe Illinois and Ohio now, as well as Florida. But the best hot dog in the whole nation, hands down. I found well, it. I'm sorry, that- Tony, but I'm, I'm afraid you're wrong in that in that regard. But uh, Portello's in Chicago is going to be the hands down quintessential uh, end all be all of the Chicago dog. I believe that at the end of this conversation. No, that well, is not I'm talking Josh. Sure wrong, Sounds sir. like the Daily Wire conversation. Uh, it's a Chicago style dog. But man, no. <laughs> the problem is, t- Josh, is Portello's went public about four years ago. And the quality has just gone down, down, and down. Yeah. Oh, now, don't tell me that because it's been yes. about five years since I was yeah. there last, and it was just oh, yes. So, so you was on the way down heart. when you had the last one, Josh. Yes. So you're saying that the wieners, uh, uh, all the hot dogs are made in China, and now the wieners are smaller. Is that is that what I'm getting from you? Saying? <laughs> it's still their hot dogs are still good. I, I'm personally a big chili dog fan. I'm not yeah. Chicago hot dog. Yeah. That that neon oh, green relish that's just strange. Love it. Just, that's the best relish in the world. It's really it's strange. Just scary looking. It's okay, but it's a little strange. <laughs> it's like grape Kool Aid, man. How, how are you guys with peppers? How are you Crackers guys with sauerkraut? Yeah. How are you guys with sauerkraut on your oh, hot dogs? Oh yeah, yes. yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. With some some horseradish and, and and brown brown uh, mustard. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so Steve yeah, was lo- Steve was looking at his watch. Is there a hot dog place nearby, Steve? And they close soon? <laughs> no, I just got text. <laughs> No, now He's you're ordering for Tellos is ready. <laughs> I think Chris uh Chris went there whenever he went to Toledo Jeep Fest. Oh. Apparently they have one uh right there next to uh uh the Toledo Jeep Fest uh place. Uh, that's Tony Paco's. Uh, yeah, Paco's tacos okay. or something right. like that's, that. Yeah, Tony Paco's. Yeah, he was thinking there was tacos in there, but it was hot dogs only. <laughs> you're I mean, all it, wrong. It the makes best sense. way to have a hot dog is the cheap ones on a plain bun, just like you get it at a baseball game or the circus, with a smear of ketchup and mustard in it, wrapped in foil, so the bun's all mushy. And that's the best way to have a hot dog. And it still costs you $10. Yeah. And yeah. ketchup doesn't belong on hot dogs. You know, I, I make them at home. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> everything. You, you take you that back. Go. You Ranch know. dressing and ketchup <laughs> belong on everything. Yeah. We, there is no sin dark? worse than putting ketchup on a hot dog. What is it, what what is it about like cooking? Chicago dogs still no ketchup. What is it about <laughs> cooking the hot dogs on an open fire like you're camping out and either on a stick or on a, a grill on an open fire? Just that that hot dog and the bread is all you need, and it's a wonderful, wonderful taste that you can't get any anywhere else that I have found. What is the deal with that? Has anybody else noticed that? That it just the one. Maybe you're just you're you're uh, in survival mode, and anything tastes good. I don't know. All the animal byproducts no. taste better burnt. Food food Ye- cooked over open flame is always always tastes better. It, does, it doesn't matter what it is. You can you can open up a can of spam. <laughs> Throw it over an open fire. It's going to taste better than anything else you've had. Oh, whenever I'm camping, Dutch oven cooking. Some of the best cooking. Hot dogs are just sandwiches, by the way. <laughs> you know you know why those hot dogs are so good, Bob? Because you bought it when you're at a baseball game or a football game, and you've just drank a 12-pack of beer, and it doesn't matter what it tastes like. You're just looking for something food-wise to put in your gut. I, I make them that way at home, though. Yeah, I will boil them hot dogs. Oh, my mom! And I take them that. out while they're still steaming. <laughs> drop them in the bun, and I'll stick them in sandwich bags and seal it, and leave them sit on the counter. And when I take them out, I squish them just a little bit. So that really, you? oh yeah. Bob likes wet wieners, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Damn right. I usually hey, hit mine with a I torch. I in the back but, end of the pack. Uh, right? I like wet wieners. I'm in the back end. 
Does it shrink? For the record, I try to divert this when I ask a question about the cape. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, the uh, the Zoom meeting uh, goes off the rails from time to time, and uh, it goes on after even after we've uh, wrapped up the recording. Uh, and sometimes it goes on to, uh, for another hour, hour and a half, and you can be a part of that. All you need to do is uh, join us uh, over on our newsletter. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact, and uh, you can sign up for a newsletter and see how you can join the Zoom room every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Central Time. And uh, it usually starts about, I don't know, about 7.30 or so uh, Central Time. And uh, people start joining in and just having general conversation. That's, uh, that's kind of fun to get on. And uh, then we have the, uh, the quote-unquote show uh, that, uh, that you've just listened to. And uh, then it continues on afterwards. And you never know who's going to be on. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm just, uh, we're just very blessed that so many people want to come and, and join here uh, every week, every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Central Time. So but join us next week, sign up for our newsletter, and uh, get the, uh, the notification, at least on Tuesday, the reminder of, uh, about the, uh, the roundtable episode. Broadcasting since 2010.